Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, episode 89. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, coming at you from Boulder, Montana, where I just shot the Montana Multigun Championship, uh, which was a cool ra- well, a cool match with uh, four stages, over 100 rounds each, and uh, a really good time, something I'm not used to, which is shooting a ton. Uh, they were definitely longer stages than uh, than I am previously have been shooting so this is a, a fun change of pace, a really cool match, a bunch of great people, and an absolutely gorgeous setting in my first time to Montana. So, uh, you know, I'm putting it on my schedule for next year, but there's about 80 shooters at this match. So it's, it's a little tough to get into, but uh, definitely worth it if you can. My guest this week is Team Trigicon shooter Nick Molina, and we discuss focusing on slowing down to get those hits instead of wasting time throwing misses. Why you should finish your practice session on a high note, and again, we hear the benefits of getting yourself a training partner and squatting with better shooters. This was an interesting one to record because uh, I just posted up at the Shotgun Pavilion at the uh, the NRA Whittington Center during the Rocky Mountain 3 Gun, and I did my thing with a bunch of people (laughs) walking by and uh, staring at me wondering what I was up to. So... If, uh, if I sound distracted uh, at any moment in time, someone's probably trying to talk to me and I'm waving them off. <laughs> so links to everything we discuss can be found at 3gunshow.com slash episode 89, or you can just tap the album art on your smartphone and it will take you right there. I usually mention this at the end, but if you like the 3 Gun Show and you're getting something out of it, tell a friend about the podcast. If you see new shooters at your local match, tell them too. You'll look like the cool guy or the cool gal for uh, sharing all this knowledge. And let's let's grow this thing. Let's grow the show. And let's do it together. You and me. Come on. <laughs> all right. All that said, on to the interview with Nick Molina. Nick, thanks for joining me on the Three Gun Show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. Well, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, you know, we met at uh, Rock Castle at the, uh, I guess, Three Man Three Gun event. Yeah. And uh, had some great Mexican food with, uh, with uh, Matt. Kupika and John Spritzer, right? Yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah. So we had a good conversation over, uh, you know, margarita and some uh, tacos and then some, uh, you know, music later on. So I got to know you a little bit here. I'd like the audience to get to know you as well. So why don't you uh, give us an idea, Nick, of who you are off the range? Uh, off the range, I'm just a normal guy. I'm really big into uh, – cars and anything automotive. I work uh, in the automotive industry, went to school for it after I graduated high school in 2007. And I've been doing that nonstop ever since. I've been at my last job for almost five years now doing engine testing, cow work and all that stuff. So it's being in the the motor city, it kind of makes sense that that's the the path that I went. So did you grow up in in Detroit then? Yeah, um, lived here all my life and Growing up, my dad had always taken me, I think you know, probably when I was around six, down uh, to Woodward Dream Cruise. So I, I grew up around cars and grew up around drag racing snowmobiles when I was younger. Uh, he started doing that, and then that got me into the whole motorhead, gearhead stuff. So it's it's been a blessing and a curse and <laughs> one expensive hobby to another. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I, I've kind of got an automotive background too, but, you know, the, you mentioned uh, drag racing snowmobiles. I, I've never even heard of that. You drag race snowmobiles is this like a quarter mile type thing um it used to be i don't know what regulations they have anymore um when my dad was doing it they had they actually cut it down to 660 feet because guys were they, they were going above and beyond they started dabbling around in nitrous and stuff like that so they were doing 130 and 660 wow. um, so then they cut it down even further when the guys came out with all the the four stroke stuff and when they started throwing turbos and superchargers and nitrous on top of that. The, these guys are absolutely flying right now. It's, oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. That's got to be insane. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's definitely something different. Yeah, no kidding. Jesus. I, <laughs> I had no idea that there was such a thing, but I guess if it's got like a motor and, you know, wheels or a track, you know, guys will race them. Oh, yeah. I've, I've even uh, been on the drag strip a couple times and seen, seen guys out there on asphalt with snowmobiles. I put wheels on the the skis and it's a complete flat track. It's it's different. Yeah, that is different. Holy cow! So where did uh, 
you know, you've been uh, into, you know, autos, mechanics, working on cars your uh, your whole life. When did that change into uh, into guns for you? That was a really sudden change. I hadn't picked up um, a firearm until I was 21. I bought my first uh, pistol. And then it was from there, just occasionally go out with some of my friends to indoor ranges and plink around. And then um, it was back in 2012. I was working at uh, General Motors with Matt Kupika, and he had been out to a couple IDPA matches. And he told me, he's like, hey, you got to come out and and shoot this with me. It's something different. I was like, all right, well, I'll give it a shot. It's better than standing in one spot shooting a paper. And we shot uh, IDPA for the rest of that year in 2012. And at the end of that season, um, we shot one USPSA match at another club and then uh, a three-gun championship. And it opened everything up to a whole new discipline. And then we dropped uh, IDPA right after that. And it's just the atmosphere that USPSA and three gun has where it's, it's more of a gamers game. If you want to call it that, it, right. it tailored to what we wanted to do more. Yeah. So more, uh, more emphasis on it actually being like a competition and a game rather than, you know, training to <clears throat> save your life while wearing a vest or something like that. Yeah, exactly. It's oh well, I can kind of see this target if I lean all the way over here around this corner. I'm still on the fault lines. Can I shoot that? Yeah, if you can see, you can shoot it. Perfect. Cool. You can bend stuff as you want, and that's what sunk us in, because then it's not more of a a shooting game. It's It adds in the factor of how well you break down a stage as well. Yeah, so you get that sort of a strategy component into it. It's not just like there is only one way to shoot this whole thing. Right, yeah, we. I don't like being told, all right, you have to shoot it exactly as it says in the stage description. This target is this weapon. It's like, it, no. This love going to the matches where it's like, all right, um, you start here, you're going to end down there. Uh, these targets are this one. These ones are optional. Um, pick what you want to do. Really? Okay, so that actually is like a uh... – uh, cause a weakness of mine trying to figure out what uh, what target to shoot with what, etc. Um, and, you know, dealing with a lot of options like that. So h- how do you approach a, a stage, and has it changed over the years? Um, in the beginning, it was, there was a lot more, I'd use my pistol more if I could, because um, I had shot that more, and a whole shooting a shotgun was new to me, and the fitment and everything on the gun wasn't right, and I couldn't load as fast, so if, if I had the option to use my pistol more, I would do it. Um, it's kind of shifted over the last couple of years, and it seems like everything's on a normal playing field, and now it's not so much uh, what platform I'm better at, but which one can I afford to use more than the other one. It, it all comes down to like a, a time-breaking thing. Like If I use this, then I've got to dump it, and that transition is going to cost me time to go to the next weapon, and it all just goes downhill from there it's it's all right if i use my shotgun i can have you know i got to run it clean i got this load um but if i use my pistol i save the transition of having to go to the shotgun and i'm a, i can do miss 10 times on this array or whatever so is it really gonna level off and be a benefit or not right yeah and it it does end up being a, like a lot of times when you have to choose between the uh, the pistol and the shotgun you think like well i've got 23 tries in this one and i've got nine tries in this one <laughs> yep that, that's a that's a big big uh, difference yeah for sure especially like when you consider like how fast you can you know load a magazine versus loading the uh you know shotgun right it all comes down to split times and what you're more confident in yeah all right so you went to that that first three gun match and was it you were completely hooked after that never went oh, back yeah, it to- was it was sold it was really the first time i'd shot my rifle uh-huh. and uh, I've got pictures and videos somewhere and oh good lord I recently just like went through all the stuff that was on it's on my USBs looking for pictures and it's like oh I, I really did that huh <laughs> <laughs> it's it was I was wearing cargo pants I had a youth model 870 20 gauge because I didn't have any other shotgun it's the only shotgun I owned that I was given when I was like 10 that I never, I think I shot it once. Um, 
So I'm pulling shells out of my cargo pockets and trying to figure out. I destroyed my hands. I got cut up loading it. It was uh, <laughs> it was an interesting experience, and it was yeah. I was like, all right, next year I gotta gotta get a new shotgun. Gotta start working on this, and this that knew that was the route that I wanted to go. So did you think that, like it was just going to be you know a hobby, something you do every now and then, or was it like okay, I'm gonna focus on this sport and you know, get to a, a higher level in it. No, uh, for the, the first year it was more just a hobby. Um, I didn't know anything outside of it except for, I, I had seen some stuff about, uh, three gun nation, the pro series on TV. Um, and then it was randomly just, I, I didn't get the channels anymore. So it disappeared. So I didn't know a whole lot about three gun except for that one match. And the first match that we shot was all, it being told exactly what you had to do. So I had no idea that there were options and stuff like that out there for other, other, uh, clubs in the state. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't know that, that that existed. So we, I ended up driving, uh, an hour and a half up to this club to shoot it. And then it, it's slowly like, Oh, well, here's a club that's a half hour away that I never knew, knew about before. And they run more of a, a run and gun hoser, type match so uh, let's go give that a shot and then first time i shot that match was at uh my home club livingston gun club where uh one of the match directors over there now and it was that's it it was done shot that thing and yeah this is more my style nice pull the trigger fast and have fun yeah and then uh you know pulling the trigger fast running and gunning it it, like doesn't get any better than that it so, it's, a, it's a good stress relief. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And it makes you feel like a hero, too. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I can do. So in the uh, in the last couple of years, then, you've seen like a, you know, rapid progression in your skills to where, you know, this year you shot in the uh, in the three gun nation uh, pro match. So yeah. what what was it that made you decide to take that from a hobby to look, I'm going to get good at this? It was just a, a natural progression thing. Um, I started shooting more over at Livingston. Um, they had a much tighter um, group of shooters. So everybody was on like a similar skill set and similar level, but then there were still a couple guys that were at the top. Um, and after the first year of shooting just the local monthly matches there and then the championship, it you know I met uh, John Spritzer, Chip Montgomery, Rick Burtz all – all those guys, and they started talking about, well, you know, we travel and we do major matches. I'm like, what's a major match? And then that, that just went into like, well, you got to come down, you know, you got to shoot Blue Ridge. It's it's the most physical match you'll shoot, and, you know, you're running a couple hundred yards and shooting out to 400 yards at the end of that, or you're slinging all your guns, and it that was that just intrigued me. So I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to start doing that stuff, I, I need to, to focus a little more on – what I'm doing here to help prepare for that. So it was one year of locals and then the next year started shooting majors. And that's when I found out about the, the pro series was in, well, what was it? 2014 it was the first time that I'd actually looked into it. And then they started doing the club series and we had some of the clubs up here. And then that's how I got my invite to nationals. And I went and or not nationals, the, the pro series qualifier. And I went there and, 2014 no 15 i get the years all messed up and Start uh, to together yeah <laughs> and then that that was it it was something that i i wanted to do i wanted to shoot with better and better people all the time just to to see where i stood nationally and where i could you know if i could hang with the the top shooters or how like if you shoot a, a match with them and they shoot it, you know, they get a hundred percent. All right. How many points and what percentage was I off of them? So they shot it in a hundred. I shot it in 80, 80% of them. I'm like, well, I feel pretty good about that. It's, it's just become a challenge for myself to see who I can hang with and, and where, where it's at nationally. Now, are, are you like a uh, naturally competitive person? Did you play any sports growing up or anything or? Um, growing up when I was in middle school, um, I did some club wrestling, but aside from that, my parents had always given me the option to go into football or baseball, soccer, do any of that stuff. And by the time I had 
gotten to that point where I was really kind of interested in it, it was, well, there's all this car stuff. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they, they told me like, you, you know, you can do whatever you want. If you want to do the, the sports, um, you know, we'll get you into, it. we'll get you the gear set up and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll cover that stuff. But if you want to do the car stuff, you, you got to fund it. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to start working. And then I, I started funding all the, the bad expensive habits. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the car thing is an expensive habit. So, did uh, you, you know? You said your dad raced uh, snowmobiles. Did you end up racing racing any anything or? Um, I wanted to really bad. I wanted to to race sleds, but the the association had had shifted directions. So then my dad and I got into trail riding. Um, but then he he'd always had that the little itch to start doing something. So then we started tinkering, and we did some like backyard drags at local. Uh, lakes and stuff like that over the winter but nothing to the extent of what it what it used to be right got it so then uh so it seems like three gun then really brought out that competitive bug in you yeah and want to see where you stack up against the uh you know the better guys out there yeah it's i've always been competitive but never been in like really competitive situations. I'd never played a whole lot of sports aside from wrestling. And then I, I stopped doing that when I just got bored with it. It was, it wasn't fun anymore. It just became more of a, like a job having to go to practice all the time and having to go to, to meets around the state. It was, eh, I'm bored. I'm done. I'd rather find something else to occupy my time with. Right. So when uh, when you started traveling for uh, for major matches, what what was uh, the first major match you went to? Oh boy, that was one I'll never forget. It was a uh, 2014 Task Force Dagger. That was uh, the we we actually we were joking around after we shot the match. We're like, you know, they should order a bunch of patches and say that you shot the Task Force Mutter match because <laughs> oh, it yeah. was the first day a complete monsoon all day long. I've got pictures of that one bay. It's, um, you were, they had it in two separate bays. So you had a 300 yard bay and then you ran over to the 200 yard and they had a mound, um, up in the middle of it. And you ran up on top of that, but then there were some of the shotgun targets were off on the side berm and the plates were falling down in the river that we called it because the water from the bay next to it was running into this one and collecting <laughs> So I've got pictures of the the RO and John Sprites are waiting out there, kicking their feet around, trying to find the plates and six inches of water. And it was, <laughs> that was a, a big eye-opening experience. Holy crap. That match was awesome, though. It was also the first match that, uh, the first match that I had ever worn jeans and gotten wet. And it was also the last match that I ever wore jeans and got wet. Because <laughs> I was miserable all day long after that. Oh, I bet. Yeah, it was right after that. I was like, all right, these pants are expensive, but uh, I'm going to start buying some shooting pants. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so your, uh, your targets are sitting there in six inches of water and just had you shoot the, you know, the through the match? They didn't uh, call any of the stages? It didn't call any of, the, uh, any of the match or anything? Nope. That was one of the matches that was uh, – Awesome. Mike Cassidy was in charge of it, and uh, – Andy Horner was helping him, and Andy does Blue Ridge, and it was, oh, well, uh, kind of sucks for you guys, but uh, yeah, get out there and start shooting. <laughs> I love that attitude. They, they, they called it, uh, towards the end of the day, they called it for a little bit, because um, down in that facility, it was a it was a massive, absolutely massive facility, and it was somewhere, um, they had lightning, so they called it for like a half hour, and then they got on the phone to all the ROs, and they're like, all right. Send them back out, have fun. The, the last stage of the day was absolutely miserable. The, you couldn't get any of the pasters to stick. So to run one shooter, it was taking probably 15 minutes because the wind picked up. So it's like the, the shooter would be on the line. And then all of a sudden, nope, we got to stop. Three of the targets fell over. So we got to go out there and reset the targets. It was an absolute <laughs> nightmare for the last stage. That's awesome. the, the next the next two days, it was the sun was out and it was like, this, this is kind of nice. Little little muggy, and uh, there's still lakes in the middle of the stages, but uh, it's not raining anymore. I, I can deal with this. Awesome, you know. You know, one of the uh, the worst feelings in the world, I think, is uh, when you go through like some sort of like wet, muddy experience, 
And then the next day after you've, you know, clean and dried off and everything, you got to go put those soggy shoes back on that didn't quite dry overnight. We got real lucky at the hotel that we were at. So we got back from the first night and Matt and I were staying uh, in the same hotel room. And it was before we went out to dinner. We just, I don't even think we had showered yet. We just grabbed all of our guns, grabbed some towels and stripped everything. So the two beds are just covered in gun parts. I've got a picture of that, and that was just, it was like, well, this is uh, the first first night, and everything is literally ripped apart right now trying to dry out, because it was just drenched. And then uh, they had a, a dryer, so we were actually able to throw our shoes and stuff in there. But it didn't matter, because the next day we went out there, and one of the stages um, was in the woods, and they had like three shooting lines, and you had to advance up, and then backtrack, and then go back up the third one. And it appeared as though it was a little... Um, mud puddle, but then as you stepped in it, you went up to your knee, <laughs> so it kind of, it was like, huh, well, this, this is how this day is going to go. I think it was our first stage of the day. <laughs> oh, man, and so, and so after that, you decided, hey, I'm going to do this more. These guys yeah. are crazy, but I'm going to keep doing this. And and I got lucky, because that was uh, the first and my first major, and it was the only major that I had ever shot in the rain that entire year. Every other match I shot was dry until um, I hit 2015, and then it was just, like, sporadic. It's the worst thing for me is shooting in the rain. I absolutely hate it. Oh, it's it just puts me in a bad mood, and I'm just like, all right, I don't even want to shoot. Just just get this over with. Get me home. Get me out of these clothes and in a warm shower where I can dry off, and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'm not very, uh, very good at dealing with, uh, you know, I don't know, adverse weather. That's that's just me. But I was surprised when uh, when I was at the Three Gun Nation Southwestern Regional, which is in uh, Copperhead Creek Shooting Range in Texas, mm-hmm. um, and it it monsooned there too. And we they actually shut down, I think, two or three of the stages or something like that. But uh, I was surprised at how much everyone was complaining about the uh the weather and you know soggy shoes and soggy socks and stuff like that and it actually made me feel quite good about myself i'm like hey <laughs> i guess i'm not alone in not not wanting to shoot in this uh weather all right no, nobody likes it but it's it, it just gets to the point where you, you start looking at the weather i bring my rain gear every time no matter what now just for that because yeah. it's it's like well you look at it the day before and yep Yep, I'm I'm gonna get wet. It's it's just gonna happen, and at that point, it's like, all right, well, uh, just just deal with it. Um, it's bound to happen, and that actually happened. Uh, we went to the the Bluegrass Shotgun Championship down in Kentucky a couple weeks ago, and it was all week long. The forecast was like 92 and 70 percent chance of thunderstorms. And it's like you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I'm driving all the way down here for a one day match to do this. And it's like, we got down there, and even the night before, it's like, yep, yep, it's going to rain. One o'clock, it's going to start to rain. You guys are going to get drenched. And then we shot all day, and nothing happened. Huh. It was hot and muggy, beyond belief, but we stayed dry all day long. And I was like, well, but but it was so hot that we were wondering, would, would we rather at this point have the rain? <laughs> because it was bad. We went through, three of us went through two cases of water in like eight hours oh man you know it's bad just, when you're actually looking yeah, it was, forward it was to the a rain really hot day oh yeah it's it's interesting though the uh you know all the matches where you're like uh, oh yeah we went down there and uh it was perfect i had no malfunctions i shot well there was the weather was great you forget about those ones right but you'll never forget that that first task force stagger match where <laughs> you're in uh you know puddles up to your knees oh no that that one's not going away that match was I, I've been disappointed every year that they haven't brought that back because that was the the last year that they had done it, and man, if they had that again, I would I'd go back in a heartbeat. That experience was was unbelievable. I've heard that, that from that, uh, that's from a match a I will people. never forget. I've heard that from quite a few people that the uh, you know Task Force Dagger match was quite the uh, quite the match. Yeah, and of course was... all the shenanigans that go along with it. Yeah, I mean it was cool shooting in a house and. Then climbing up the uh, the four stories on top of the Connex boxes to shoot out there, and it was yeah, that was crawling through the mud was also quite memorable too. 
So those uh, those more physical matches were, you know, you, you mentioned Blue Ridge, and uh, you're talking about the Task Force Dagger um, obstacles and everything. Is is that like your forte? Do you like doing that kind of stuff, or do you prefer it to be like a, you know, USPSA style match? Uh, I, I like the mixture of it. Um, I like going to the the matches, like uh, you know, what's going to happen this year, Three Gun Nation Nationals, where everybody's going to be there. The, the top competitors are going to be there and you get to see a bunch of new guys out there for the first time. It was last year at nationals. We met uh, Paul from South Africa. So it's, it's just cool seeing all the different people, but at those matches, the level of competition is it's the highest. Like we, um, I've been trying to find a match where it's like, all right, all the top guys in the country are going to this match. I have to go because everybody's going to be there. Like, I, I want to see, with everybody at the same match, where I fall. But then it's matches like Blue Ridge and, and TFD that I, I just enjoy shooting them. Just for the, the physical aspect that gets thrown into it as well. It's it's more of a, I want to say, I, I enjoy the punishment of a match like that. It's just fun. Nice. <laughs> and the... Uh... The punishment for um, for a lot of people does come with those, uh, you know, like Iron Man and and uh, Blue Ridge, and then for uh, you know some people for the uh, Rocky Mountain Three Gun, which is where uh, where I'm I'm actually recording this from right now. So the uh, it seems to be like something that's ingrained within the Three Gun culture, whereas you wouldn't find that like in a in a pistol match. People would complain about having to you know cruise through a gully and run past snakes and toads and through mud and everything whereas uh in three gun it just seems to be like part of the deal yeah well nick i want to switch up gears a little bit here and and talk a little bit about um you know your uh your technique your strategy for the game and how you've put all that into play and how you took yourself from you know newbie shooter to now i want to compete with the uh the, the rest of the country at these bigger matches so where where did uh where did you start when you decided look I'm I want to be up against the best guys in in the uh country where did you start like practice wise or range time um I just kept going back out to my club all the time they they leave a lot of steel out there and they've got a couple plate racks so it was oh I'm just gonna take the the gear that I've got and then for a while um when I first started doing the quad loads I'd go out there and I'd run the load 12 drills and practice loading on the move and set up barrels across the bay and do sprints while loading. But I've never really had a, a really good solid training regimen, which is just weird because usually I'm very anal about that stuff and very particular, but it's a lot of the times it's, um, I go out two, three times a week, uh, before work when I was on second shift and now that I'm on first shift, it's, I go out there after work cause it's, uh, kind of like halfway between where I work and home. That's perfect. Um, yeah. So e- even if it was just for, just for a little bit, I go out there and run, run my handgun on the plate rack and, you know, start off 10 yards away and then, you know, keep moving back to like 20 yards. And then at the, the end of the practice session, whatever I was doing, I'd always make the, the last thing that I, I run easy. So always make it like, uh, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to run the plate right with my pistol, but I'm going to do it 10 yards away and I'm just going to end on a good note. I don't want to end frustrated and all upset that things didn't go. I like, I, I, that way I didn't feel like I didn't accomplish anything. So running the plate rack really quick. I was like, all right, that, that felt good. Shot it clean and pack up, go home and then come back out the next day. Uh, that's uh that's a, a good way of looking at it like you want to leave on a, a high note i think uh you know a lot of times uh people forget that like we want to practice those tough and difficult shots and you know plate racket 50 yards with your pistol <laughs> but yeah. when uh when you're ending it to keep it fresh in your head like you know that you're good or that you enjoy this thing it's you're smart to do that and end on a high note like that yeah it's I've noticed doing stuff before. If you if you leave frustrated, it just it compounds to the next time that you go out, and it it never ends well. It's, I've seen a lot of my friends do that too, where it's 
you know, they haven't shot in a really long time. So they, they come out and they expect to be right at the level that they were, you know, before when they were shooting all the time. And then they're not. So they get, get they get upset, they get frustrated. So then they keep trying harder and harder and harder. And then things just keep going downhill and they go downhill faster. And then it's, then they're done. They just check out. And it's like, well, <laughs> that kind of sucks. <laughs> it does suck. Now, do you have like uh certain drills that you do every time you go out there do you go out with, uh with a plan or do you just kind of wing it i wing it yeah it's oh yeah i go out it's like oh well they got uh there's some targets that are left out here i'm I'm gonna do this or you know, sometimes or i'll go out there and i'll focus on a, a particular thing like um before the my pro series match this year i went out and focused a lot on offhand rifle shots so I did a lot of stuff with that, and then um, empty shotgun starts. I was I was actually training for a specific style of match or a specific discipline. I guess you'll say it did. It depends on what match I'm going to is what I'll fixate on and try to practice the most. If I know there's going to be particular um, like certain things, so something I wanted to do for the the pro match is I wanted to shoot um, a spinner at 50 yards because I'd never done it. And then I set that up and I set up other steel um, off to the side. So I'd hit the spinner, move to one of the other steels and just practice transition. And then the big thing was like timing. So I'd, I'd try to fixate on one little thing. But then there's other days I go out there and I've got all my guns and it's like, all right. Um, well, there are some targets. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's just shoot them today and see what happens. A lot of the times I just go out there and screw off and have fun. That's good. You know, uh, seems like a lot of times, you know, when you take something too seriously, it ends up not being fun. So it's good to uh, go out there and actually have that fun and remind you why you got in, into it in the first place, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was a couple of weeks ago. I took uh, my girlfriend out shooting because she had never shot handguns. So I just brought a, a bunch of my pistols and I'm loading up stuff for her to shoot. And then as, you know, she's out there shooting, I'm watching her. Um, teaching her stuff and then i'd load up a mag and i'm like oh well i haven't shot my uh 1911 in a long time let's have some fun with this and it's like it, that was just an enjoyable day something that i haven't done i usually just shoot my competition guns non-stop i never have a day to just go out to the range and then screw off with stuff that i have sitting in the safe that's been neglected for two years yeah that's a that's a good point i was looking at um a uh a saw was like tactical solutions or something 1022 barrel uh, yeah. that was like a super, super discount when I was at, uh, Cabela's a couple of days ago. And I was thinking like, wow, you know, it'd be cool to fit my 1022 with that thing. And then I was trying to remember the last time I shot my 1022 because <laughs> just like you, like all I do is shoot my three gun stuff. Like I can't even remember the last time I shot like my, you know, Glock 17 that I started shooting with. Yeah. That's, I'll occasionally go out and, uh, run a mag through my, my M and P cause it's, it's the gun that I started um, all the USPSA stuff. And then it was the, the one I used in three gun for years, but it's still my carry gun. It's, it was my carry gun when I, before I started shooting. And then it just, it was like, well, if I'm going to shoot competitively, might as well shoot with what I carry. And it's still every day. It's a full size M and B and it's got to go out and have fun with it and make sure that I can still actually hit targets at distance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's that's how I started with uh, with a 17 instead of an M&P, but yeah, full size. And then I'm like, hey, well, I guess I should probably take this to a, a match and see if I can hit stuff with it. Right. So, you know, Nick, you were talking about um, uh, focusing on the next match. So give us an idea of what match you have coming up and then how you're going to uh, focus your practice in the next coming weeks. The... Uh... Well, the next one that we're going to be traveling to is going to be um, FNH. And considering, I, I don't even know if I've seen the stage descriptions for that one yet. Um, I don't know what they're going to have, but it's over the last couple of years, it's always been a mixture of like the natural terrain and then a couple uh, fast bay style stages. So it's for that match, it, it's hard to do anything. But I've over the last probably month and a half, I've been slacking so much on practice that I'm just going to go back out and 
start running plate racks again and doing load drills with a shotgun. Um, I always like practicing uh, offhand rifle just because it's it's fun and it's something that uh, if you're not practicing it often, it's like any other stuff. It just it falls off quick, really quick. So right. it's that'll help. Um, we don't have a whole a whole lot of areas that we can go and practice long range. Um, our club we have a hundred yards, but aside from that, it takes us two and a half hours to travel to uh, the next club, and they've got five hundred meters. Um, I've been there once this year, and that was uh, I think that was before the the Vortex Nordic match. So it's it making trips out there to practice any distance stuff, which is what. I really want to practice. It's it's really difficult for us to do it out here. So it's it's usually just uh, focus on base stuff. For FN, it'll probably end up being just a lot of uh, movement. I'll try to focus on getting into the next position, and rather than getting into position and then finding the target and then lining up the sights as I'm coming into the position and getting ready to stop that I'm on target. So like when I stop, like if it's in a shooting box or I know I've got to go to this particular corner to see this array, but as I'm getting into that spot, I'm on target and ready to go. That's, I know that's where I'm lacking a lot of my ability and a lot of time when it comes to uh, shooting the big matches. Now, is this, uh, is this something that you figured out yourself or did you, um, get some some help with this from like a mentor do you do you go to like uh classes and and learn uh you know what you're deficient at or is just through Um, self-assessment yeah i don't do any classes um i spend a lot of time talking with uh matt and the other guys that we shoot with and it's when matt and i first started shooting together it was always a toss-up like all right who didn't screw up this match is the one like between the two of us who's gonna win it so for the first little bit, we were always neck and neck and bouncing back and forth. And then he got on his training regimen. And ever since then, he's just been steadily pulling that gap. And I can actually, watching him shoot, I can see a lot of time that I'm losing just in in movement. See, he spent a lot of time doing um, transitional stuff, really hard transitions, target to target, because he saw that there's a just a loss in time there. That everybody can shoot just as fast as the next guy, but it's getting going from one target to the next is where they're losing time. Or moving from this box to that box and getting into position, there's a couple seconds there, but over nine stages, it it adds up to a couple places um, once you finish the match. So it's watching him do stuff and then like comparing my times and our strategies looking similar but not identical. Um, I, I can slowly start to break it down. Like, all right, well, I, I know he's pulling on me in this area, so I need to start focusing on this. But Matt is the uh, the guy locally and even nationally that I'm I've been trying to chase down for the last year and a half. Well, well that's cool to uh, you know have that <laughs> shooting partner you start at the same time, and then uh, you know to be able to have like a benchmark to compare yourself to, and also sort of like a sled dog thing where you know they encourage each other to get better as, right. as they, uh, or, or faster, I guess, as the, the case may be. And that, that's what we tell a lot of the guys around here, a lot of the, the local shooters. And even when we, um, run like our, our intro classes is that if you want to advance, one of the easiest things that you can do aside from actually going out and practicing is when you go to these matches, when you go to local matches or whatever, squad yourself with better shooters, because then you watch them and you just, see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And then you start to pick up on the smaller things, you know, maybe this match you can pick up more on stage breakdown um, to tailor to your strengths and your skill sets. But then you can also pick up on other little things like, all right, well, he's doing this really well and I know I suck at it and I can see the time that he's gaining by doing it. So I, I need to start working on that little stuff. It's, it's always that the competitive edge too. So if you know you're at this level and you're shooting with the guys that are a level above you, you're pushing yourself to maintain the same times and everything that they are. But then at some point you realize you're pushing too far and you start to suffer. So then you realize, all right, well, I can go this hard and be consistent. But if I push it a little more, 
it's either going to come together, connect, and it's going to be an awesome run, or I'm going to tank it horribly. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. <laughs> and how, how do you decide, you know, when to throttle it up like that and, uh, you know, go for it or when to, you know, kind of hold a little bit in reserve and not quite go 100%? It, it's been uh, just like a, a gut feeling. When I go to a, a major match, if I know that like the first two days have been, they've been solid. Um, you know, they haven't been absolutely great. Or I know that I've got some times that are, you know, top five stage finishes that, all right, well, okay, I've got two stages left. I don't need to just, just finish them. Don't DQ and just don't screw it up. Remember, okay, well, there's that one target there that's hidden. So I, I need to remember to not miss this one target or not walk past it. But then there's other times where it's you go to the match and it's like, all right, well, uh, I'm not nearly where I want to be. And, well, it's this is either going to be an awesome run or it's going to look awesome because I'm going to tank it horribly. <laughs> either way, it'll be a good Facebook video, right? Exactly. <laughs> Well, Nick, uh, what area of the game do you think that you need to work on the most? Oh, boy. I think that's everything right now. Um, for a while, I, I felt my, my pistol game was really strong, and I've noticed that um, fall off a little bit just because of the the lack of shooting and the lack of handling my guns all the time, which is a big one. Shotgun's not bad. I, I think rifle might be the strong point. Um, last year, I, I definitely had the last couple matches. I had my, my rifle game and holdovers and distance and everything figured out, but this year it's, it's a toss up. It, it might be rifle or jeez. Yeah. I, I couldn't even say. Now, do you think that's, uh, because you've evened out your, your abilities then your, your shotgun and rifles caught up to your pistols, your, your, uh, excuse me, your pistol game. Um, the, the, the rifle is, has picked up a little bit. Um, but the, the, my shotgun has, has definitely excelled from when I first started. I, I know that for a fact, because that's where in the game that I've always seen, like the, the easiest way to gain time is just be able to run, run a shotgun smooth. Um, don't drop any shots and just hit your loads. It's, it's the easiest thing that you can actually tone it back a little bit and be faster because, you're making the hits so you don't have to, to load that extra quad, which all adds up time. So it's like, all right, well, I, I throttle down just a little bit and I'm going to run it smoother, run it faster. It gives me more time to focus on, all right, I finished this array. So as soon as I get done doing this, I got to load eight, but then I know I've got to cover 10 feet or 10 yards or whatever it may be. So it's like, all right, I got that distance to load that. So as soon as I'm done, that last load goes in, the shotgun comes up, and right then my foot is in position ready to go. So it's it it allows you to focus more on the smaller things and not feel rushed the entire time. So that that helped my my shotgun stuff pick up a lot. Um and I think since I had spent more time on hard rifle transitions and hard shotgun wow. transitions that I didn't practice as much with my pistol, and that's kinda fallen back over the last year or so a little bit. So I, I, I know I need to get back out and uh, work on pistol for for a good couple weeks. Gotcha. Now, so if you're if you're going to be setting up your uh, you know your practice for the next couple weeks, knowing that you need to focus on pistol, uh, and if assuming you didn't just uh, go out and shoot whatever was lying on the range, <laughs> how would you focus that uh, that practice for your your pistol skills? Um, do a lot of transitions um a big thing is for me is actually going from a target that's over like 11 o'clock on my left and then transitioning all the way over to three o'clock right at the 180 on my right it's making the hard transition and not overshooting it but getting it stopped right on and ready to rip the shot so a lot of a lot of it goes into that but then i also need to start focusing on the further pistol shots that if you get it one for one, it's it's going to be awesome, but it's it's easy to pull the shot and and lose a lot of time on the longer one. So I'll spend time 
burning the plate rack down really quick, but then also um, focus on the longer shots too. Yeah, th those uh, longer pistol shots definitely are, you know, they're they're tempting, you know, like we were talking about earlier. Like, oh, I can use my pistol on this instead of using my shotgun. But then if you end up, you know, throwing four or five rounds at it to try to knock it down, it ends up not quite being worth it. Yeah. So that that's that's definitely something I need to do. Uh... Oh, sorry about that. Hold on a second. That's right. No, I was going nuts. You're probably in danger of uh, being accosted. There's an intruder or something. Eh, it's just the UPS guy, so she's going crazy. He's dropping <laughs> off uh, packages for the, the championship. Ah, cool. So that's a uh, it's a weird transition for the dog barking to bring up the championship, but we uh, we chatted about this briefly over uh, Facebook Messenger, and I wanted to bring it up on the on the uh, show. So you you have a, a major match that you guys are putting on over the next couple. Uh, um, what is it next next couple weeks? Is that right? Um, I wouldn't call it a a major. Mid mid major. Uh, just, just call it a, a glorified local. Gotcha. So you've got a glorified local coming up now. Um, so, so coming into this from, uh, you know, just shooting USPSA, IDPA, transitioning to three gun, it seems like a rapid acceleration. And now you're, you know, helping to put on these, uh, these larger matches for the, you know, the good of your club and stuff like that. What made you decide to you know, get involved in, in that way rather than just be a shooter? Uh, a lot of it's because of the guys that I shoot with. It's all the guys that I travel with, and they are they were doing it. Um, and then one of the other guys stepped down, so I was like, all right, well, I, I already invest this much time into it. I'm already coming out to all the match setups anyways. I'm already shooting all the matches for the entire year. Well, I might as well just – join in on the program so that way I can learn more about the game as well as far as stage design, which then it helps out a lot with uh, stage breakdown too. But it was just, well, I'm, I'm, I'm up to my my knees. Might as well just jump in the rest of the way and <laughs> do it all at once. Might as well. Yep. So, okay, that that's interesting that you said that, uh, you know, designing stages helps with stage breakdown. I've, I haven't heard that yet. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's because when we set up the the stages, it's, you know, I'll set up a stage or Matt or one of the other guys will do it. And they know the general idea. So they look at it at a, at a particular way on how they kind of want to corral the shooters to, to do something, but they don't want to come out and say it in the stage description or they'll leave out a bunch of options or they'll, you know, set it up and they'll see certain things. But then at the end of the day, we'll all all of us will get together and walk through and then all of us look at the stages and it's like, well, did you see this over here? Because you kind of want that intended to be shot from over on that side, but I can see it from this point of view or I can lean this little bit and it's, you see how everybody else breaks down the stages at the same time. So then you can kind of throw that in and how you do it, but it, it's different because you see the, the whole the, the other side of it as as you're setting it up that you've got to, all right, well, this one, so that way, you know, this person can't just stand in one spot and shoot all the targets that I've got to put a wall up here. I got to put barrels here and it's, it makes it more challenging because you got to look at it as far as you want to set up a good stage, but at the same time, you've got to make it difficult, but not too easy. So it's, it, it's just weird how it happens. I don't, really know how to explain it but yeah, it's just it's cool because as you're setting it up you're running through your head like all right well i could do this but then other guys might do this and then you're walking and you're like well well crap i moved that barrel a little bit too much and now you can see half the stage over on this side so you got to readjust and then redesign and i don't know it's... It, it reminds me of the uh, concept of uh red teaming have you heard have you heard of red teaming no it's it's basically like in uh, software or even like government intelligence, they create uh, what's called a red team, and it basically is this focus team that operates independently and tries to uh, subvert the activities of 
you know, the people that are actually creating the product are going on the, on the, uh, or designing the mission and stuff like that. So from what you're saying, it's like, you're, you know, setting up a stage and you're simultaneously trying to pick apart, uh, your own stage. And then your buddies are coming along and trying to pick apart your stage as well and game it to like, you know, the, the degree that a normal competitor would come and do it. So then you have to improve your, your stage as a result of that. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. It's, it works out really well for us because we all see it differently. Um, like we all have our different mindsets and all of us think differently and think outside the box and the other one. So it's, that's why it works really well for us is one person will set it up, but then the rest of us will get together and look at it and it, it just completely changes how they thought everything should have been. And it, it it's real eye opener. So you, you get to, to pick up on what everybody else is doing and, and see their strengths, see your strengths, and then sometimes tie everything together as well. That's awesome. And so it's, uh, sounds like an interesting way to, um, you know, to learn that stage breakdown and, you know, obviously you get a, you know, a greater benefit for the club too, because now you're, you're volunteering to do all of it. Although it does probably take a lot of your time up. Yeah. Um, it, it, it needs a lot of time. I, I think uh, I'm already 150 hours um, volunteering this year, and that's not including all the the emails and everything that I've sent out for sponsorship requests for our championship that I've I've done at home. It was last week. It's probably at least 20 hours, and then I was doing stuff last night until eight nine o'clock, making phone calls, and I even got some phone calls today while I was at work. So it's. It's definitely uh, not without sacrifice, but it's it's fun at times. <laughs> There's other times that I, I want to pull my hair out and just say I'm done and hand everything over to the other guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can imagine. Well, yeah, it's it's totally like a you know having another part time job. Yeah, it, that definitely is. We our next match is uh, two weeks away now, and it's. Matt and I are sitting here thinking about it like, well, uh, we know who's not going to be here, so it's, it's just going to be the two of us, and yeah, this is going to be a long weekend. <laughs> so, Nick, uh, you know, uh, turning it back to the uh, the shooting side of things, one of the cooler things that you, uh, you know, did, have done this year has been uh, to go to the Three Gun Nation Pro Match. Mm-hmm. Um, g- give us an idea of, what that match was like, what the experience was like, you know, going to VIR and, uh, yeah. and shooting in the dark under the lights and everything and, you know, getting your, your glamour shots taken and all that. How did that, uh, how was that experience for you? Um, uh, this year wasn't nearly as, as nerve wracking, I'll say. Um, cause I was actually in the, the pro series last year when it was, um, still over in Tulsa mm-hmm. and, that one was, that was a real eye opener because it was a drove all the way down there by myself and you know didn't didn't know anybody so it's the first time that I I'd, I'd met these guys or heard of them um, and like when they, when they do the glamour shots it's like that was uh, really really interesting because it's <laughs> you're always the first thing I thought of is you're always told you know never to do something and it's like all right well. I'm going to stick this camera right down the muzzle of your barrel. And it's like, what? <laughs> well, well, we know it's clear. I was like, it, it's still, it's one of those things. Like you, you got to be kidding me. It's like, yeah. this is all I've ever known is like not to do this. And you're, you're telling me to do it. So at that, and the, the big thing after the, when I shot the first stage, um, it, it was like, all right, handed, uh, robbed my gun um and I, I turned around and it was two feet away there's a camera shoved in my face and chad's there with a microphone I'm like whoa <laughs> what, what's what's going on this is a little different I'm like i know you said this is gonna happen but good lord give me some space <laughs> it's a little different than the uh you know unload show clear and then you go get your uh your alone time right yeah it's it's like all right, you don't even have time to think about what just happened and they're asking any questions it's like, they asked me, like, oh, you know, how, how do you think it went? I'm like, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what just happened. <laughs> did, did I hit everything? Did I miss something? Like, what? 
give me a minute. So, I mean, that that adds to the show, though, for sure, because it's yeah. like you're done shooting and it's boom. Hey, hey, answer this. How do you think it went? Uh, where, where do you think things went well? Did it did it go well? Did things fall apart? Like, well, you know, are you trying to trick me? Is this this one of those questions? Like, you know, I did really well, but you're trying to make it sound like it did horrible to see my reaction. <laughs> So you're trying to you're trying to figure out if they're uh, if they're messing with you. Just like what, what's your angle here, Chad? Yeah, it it was man that the, the entire night I was just nervous. By the end of the night, after I um on the last uh, the third stage after I got eliminated, I was like, ah, oh, well, uh, the nerves are gone. So now I'm kind of relaxed a little bit. This is this is different. Now, well, I just get to stand around and watch. Yeah, <laughs> now you get to watch all the other guys be nervous. Yeah. So, then- so it was, it's, it's different. It, the, the format's completely different shooting at night with all the, the generators and everything going for all the lights, which that's all you hear when you're walking around, talking to everybody, watching everybody else shoot. But then once you hit the buzzer and you go, you, you forget all of it. it. You can't hear any of it anymore. And you're just focused and in the zone and it's nobody's behind you. You don't no different than shooting a major match. Like it's, Everybody that's watching, you know everybody's watching you, but you, you completely forget about it. All right. Now, so uh, this year when you went then, was it uh, – were you more relaxed because you you knew what to expect and you knew the – you know, they were going to stick the camera in your face right when you were done shooting and everything? Yeah, I was definitely uh, more relaxed this year. Um, I, I wasn't – I don't think I was as confident and prepared as I was um, – last year just for the fact last year I shot at the end of the season so I had all year to practice I I knew that I was at the top of my game for that year and that time of the year this year since everything you know they they wanted to move everything up and get the matches done sooner so it was earlier in the season um I mean I had practiced a lot but it was still I, I didn't feel as confident as I did the year before I mean it was it was more relaxed and I wasn't on edge but you know, it was a new for a change what to expect, which that helped a lot, helped out a lot, but it, well, it obviously didn't help out enough. So then, uh, you know, for the for the audience that doesn't have Mav TV, so how how did the match go for you? Um, well, I'll just say bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the the first like when we were um, out there during the day, everything felt felt really good. I, I felt like it was everything was going to come together. Um, I knew that if I I made it into the the uh, the last, last stage with the spinner, the 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 plan that I had, and with the amount of time that I had practiced on the spinner, and then um, knock down steals next to it at, at home, that I was going to be able to to run risks on that stage. And if everything came together like it, I practiced enough. Um, even if I had missed one or two shots, that that, that was going to be a really good stage. And I, I guess I had focused so much on that stage and getting to it that I, I kind of forgot about what I needed to do on the other stages. Um, the, the first stage wasn't horrible. It wasn't it definitely wasn't the greatest by far. But um, that one got me into, into stage two. And then... That one when I, I picked up my pistol on the last array and I did the reload. The reload screwed up my grip and then all of a sudden you you see me readjust my hands and my entire grip, my shoulders and everything. And it was like, well, it I, I even knew it. I was like, all right, I've got three targets left, three papers. Can I just power through it? And then it was after that first shot. I'm like, nope, there's no way I'm going to miss everything. So I had, I knew I had to readjust and it, yeah bad <laughs> so uh then that was the uh second stage so then yeah do you, do you have to end up going to the eliminator then yep um i went to the eliminator and that was the uh you didn't have to load your shotgun but you started with it with nine rounds on the uh the polish plate rack with a kick out plate and which is nine targets right four four yep. and one more for the uh kick out yep Yep, that 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 would be it. And it <laughs> works out really great if you don't miss one of the shots. Um, 
but uh, it was Candace Horner went up uh, before me, and she just shot it smooth and clean. And it, it didn't the once she kicked the knockout plate, it didn't spin a whole lot. So then she shot it. And I'm like, all right, well, I I know that I can make up time, and that I can as, as long as I don't go too crazy and try to go complete ham on it that you know I, I should be safe and then it was like i got up there the buzzer went off and i was like squeeze the trigger really fast go 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 <laughs> and yeah well missed one of them and then i was like all right it wasn't my last shot so i knew as soon as i missed it crap all right i've got to do the match saver so when i hit the last one i went to slide lock reached for the match saver and then that got all screwed up and turned around at that point i just broke my shoulder threw in the gun let it go home and uh, shot the last play. And I was like, well, th- that's it. <laughs> like that, that did not go nearly well as I had everything running through my head. My head, it was like two point seconds fly, like nothing. It was good. Great. And then it was like, well, crap. That was like 10 seconds. That was, that was really bad. <laughs> so what, what is uh describe that feeling then when, uh, you know, after you're done shooting, you had some, uh, some issues, and, uh, you know, it's probably not good enough to, uh, to keep you in the running. Yeah, I was, uh, after that, it was, it was definitely upsetting. I was kicking myself hard because I knew that, that I, I could have, could have made it into three for sure. And I, I was fairly confident that I, I could have won it, but it was just like, you know, maybe that got into my head too much and I didn't actually focus on what I needed to do. Like, I don't want to sound like a, an arrogant guy, but maybe I I just got too cocky thinking that I could have done it and I underestimated everybody else. And that's, that is a huge thing. And I I even told myself in the beginning, like, all right, well, you know, I, I didn't know buddy and I didn't know Ryan. I'd never heard of those guys before. And then even Matt had brought up the point, like you You've never heard of them. You don't know them, but look at it from this side. You were that guy last year. You were the the rookie that nobody had ever heard about. And it, last year it was, I I turned in some of the fastest times of the year, and it I was killing it last year. So it's it's the wild card. You you never know what the wild card is going to be able to pull off. And it's I think that got into my head a little bit. So it was after. After everything happened, I was just beating myself up. I was like, this is this is ridiculous. Where did I go wrong? And then it's like I'm looking through everything and and rerunning everything in my head. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I can can kind of see where, where things went downhill on this one. So then uh those lessons that you've learned from that match, you know, you've you've had time to to think about it. You've had time to, you know, probably stew on them a little bit, just uh <laughs> just uh guessing by the sound on your voice there um what is uh what's the plan going forward uh for for the remainder of the season and then uh you know for for next year it's i i need to stay stay focused i'm not nearly as focused as i was um last season not not even close and that's uh that's a huge thing um going to a lot of the matches it's Locally, I've just been getting burnt out and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll shoot the match, and it'll be so hot that by the end of the day, I'm like, you know, that I mentally just check out, and it's like I'm almost walking through the stage, just because I'm so beat and tired. But I need to focus more on national stuff and go back to what I was doing last year and using the local matches as the time to to test and push my limits. Like you use the local match since it's, it is just a local to, all right, well, if I crank it up a little bit more here, is it, is it safe to do in a match setting? Cause yeah, okay. It might work in practice, but if I do it in an actual match when I'm on the clock and trying to be competitive, cause I'm watching everybody else shoot, am I going to get too far ahead of myself and think that I can do more than I can? The, the, the mental game is something that I, I need to, to fix and start working on for the rest of the season for sure. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, having that sort of last stage of the day, you know, kind of walking through it, just going through the motions. I I felt that a lot myself and 
I'm wondering how you how you deal with that. How you know now that you've recognized that it's a it's a problem. How you stay focused for the entire day or keep your head in the game? It's a lot of it has started uh, started drinking a lot more water and stuff like that just to to not burn myself out. But then it's as the day goes on, it's like all right, last stage. I want to get out of here. Want to get back to the hotel room, but it's it's the last stage. It's not not over yet. It still can go horribly wrong. I can still, you know, DQ. So I, I got to stay in it. And it's, as I get up to the line, it's even if it's, if it's the very last stage for the match, it's like, all right, smooth, easy. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Don't trip over yourself. Don't do anything stupid. Just finish. And then once it's done, it's like, all right, sweet. That's it. I can put my stuff away. I don't care if it gets tossed around and thrown around and whatever. I'm I'm done. I'm ready to to relax, and it's like a very happy moment. Yeah, it's a great feeling when you can finally take off that uh you know shooter's belt and uh, toss it in the bag, and then just kind of relax. And yeah, sure, I'll reset all these targets. I don't mind. Yeah, it's like ah, I'm just gonna set all this stuff out. I'm gonna untuck my shirt. And, oh yeah. yeah, that feels good. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, you guys still got to shoot. That sucks. I'm done. <laughs> so Nick, so Nick, the uh, you know the focus is something you're going to be working on uh, going in the future, um, and you know wish you all the best in that and everything. Got a couple last uh, questions here for you. A couple of questions I ask all my guests. First is going to be where where do you see the sport of three gun headed? Well, it's uh, it's it's going in the right direction. I've from what I've seen, just from the, the couple of years that I've been in it, it's, it's exploded. Um, not just from like the, the three gun nation side of it, but even outlaw and local matches, um, local matches have started popping up and we've now got our, our first one that's, uh, in the upper peninsula up here in Michigan. And it's the desire and the drive for, for three gun is, is increasing unbelievably, at least here in Michigan. Um, We've had it at our monthly matches a handful of people, so anywhere from usually eight to twelve first time shooters that want to come out and, and try their hand at it. So it's it is gaining popularity for sure. And I know Three Gun Nation's pushing a lot of it too, as far as um the stuff that they're doing specifically for like the Three Gun Nation organization, but it since they're doing it in that sense, it's also pushing more people to find like as you would call them outlaw, I guess local matches that don't follow the the three gun nation rule set. So it's the publicity that they're doing is also helping to grow just the sport in general. So it's I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. It may it's only a matter of time before the the level of sponsorship and support that we're getting from all the companies goes downhill. Just because it you can't keep spending all this money and not see a return on investment and well eventually you got to make the smart financial decision not to do it anymore or to really cut back on what you're doing so it, it may turn into more of a like a major USPSA match where they get some stuff but it's all random draw it's not nearly to the level that we uh we see at national matches now but the support will still be there but the sport's just going to continue to grow in my opinion I like it Nick, can you tell me about your your most spectacular disqualification? Oh, you just had to bring that up, didn't you? Uh, I need, yeah, I did. I need wood. I need wood. <laughs> knock, knock on wood. Ever since I've started shooting, I have never never DQ'd. Oh, very nice. It, it's only a matter of time, but I, I have yet to have it happen, and I, I don't know how. I've had some extremely close calls. And probably some calls that uh, had the RO been standing in a, at a, like seen it from a different angle, probably would have called it a DQ. But yeah, I, I've been very lucky, and that that's all it is. It's all luck. It's not not talent because it, it everyone at some point in the game gets DQ'd. Well, hopefully your uh, your streak continues, uh, and uh, we'll knock on the everybody knock on wood for Nick there. So. Just- Nick, last last question here. If you can leave the uh, audience with just one thought or one piece of advice, what would it be? Have fun. 
<laughs> that's that's still the reason that I I go out to to the matches is just to to have fun and enjoy it. It's there's the competitive side to it, but if you're doing it for a job or you're doing it for other reasons than to have fun, it it you don't get the enjoyment factor out of it anymore. It, it becomes more of a, a hassle and a pain in the neck. So as long as you're you're enjoying it, it's that's the best thing that can happen. I love that advice. That's a that's a great final thought, Nick. This has been a lot of fun, man. It's uh, it's great getting to know you uh, a little deeper here and hear about your uh, your great match experiences and and how you've gotten to the level that you're at. And uh, wish you the best luck in the future. And thanks for joining me on the Three Gun Show again. Yeah, no problem, Dave. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. It was definitely something I thought about before, and uh, when you asked me, I was like, "All right, sweet, I'm in. Count me in." Well, perfect. I'm glad it worked out. I hope you enjoy that interview with Nick Molina. This was a great interview to do and a lot of fun. I really loved uh, Nick's honest assessment about his Three Gun Nation uh, pro match experience and uh, his commitment to getting better as a result of what happened at that match. Again, I'll have links to everything that we talked about at threegunshow.com slash episode 89. Uh, now, I've gotten a lot of requests for the Three Gun Show stickers over the last few months, and now you can purchase them in the Three Gun Show store, which is handily located at threegunshow.com slash store. You can also support the Three Gun Show podcast by using our affiliate link when you shop at Brownells. Just go to threegunshow.com slash Brownells and shop like normal. We earn a small commission on what you buy at no additional cost to you, and uh, it helps keep the lights on over here and uh, and the mics are running. Remember, if you like the show, please tell a friend. Show them how to subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, etc., and how to leave a review. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Unload show clear.